The reading this morning begins at uh, chapter 15 of Revelation. If you're using a, a church Bible, there should be some dotted around the place. That begins on page 252, right at the back of the New Testament. So Revelation chapter 15, beginning to read at verse 1. Then I saw another portent in heaven, great and amazing, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last, for with them the wrath of God is ended. And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mixed with fire, and those who had conquered the beast and its image, and the number of its names standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Great and amazing are your deeds, Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Lord, who will not fear and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your judgments have been revealed. After this I looked, and the temple of the tent of witness in heaven was opened. And out of the temple came the seven angels with the seven plagues, robed in pure bright linen, with golden sashes across their chests. Then one of the four living creatures gave the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God, who lives for ever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one could enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were ended. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple telling the seven angels, Go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. So the first angel went and poured his bowl on the earth, and a foul and painful sore came on those who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped its image. The second angel poured his bowl into the sea, and it became like the blood of a corpse, and every living thing in the sea died. The third angel poured his bowl into the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters say, You are just, O Holy One, who are and were, for you have judged these things. Because they shed the blood of saints and prophets, you have given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve. And I heard the, the altar respond, Yes, O Lord God, the Almighty, your judgments are true and just. The fourth angel poured his bowl on the sun, and it was allowed to scorch people with fire. They were scorched by the fierce heat, but they cursed the name of God who had authority over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. The fifth angel poured his bowl on the throne of the beast, and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in agony and cursed the God of heaven because of their pain and sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. The sixth angel poured his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its waters was dried up in order to prepare the way for the kings of the east. And I saw three foul spirits like frogs coming from the mouth of the dragon, from the mouth of the beast, and from the mouth of the false prophet. These are demonic spirits performing signs, who go abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle on the great day of God the Almighty. See, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and is clothed, not going about naked and exposed to shame. And they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Harmageddon. The seventh angel poured his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne, saying, It is done. And there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a violent earthquake, such as had not occurred since people were upon the earth. So violent was that earthquake. The great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. God remembered great Babylon and gave her the wine cup of the fury of his wrath. And every island fled away, and no mountains were to be found. And huge hailstones, each weighing about a hundred pounds, dropped from heaven on people, until they cursed God for the plague of the hail. So fearful was that plague. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
You might want to uh, grab a Bible. Might be useful as we go through all of this. Well, I at least have your empathy, don't I? Um, <laughs> it's a bit movie-worthy, don't you think? With last week's and this week's. I mean, I don't know what your preferred genre of movie is. I don't think I'd sleep well after one like this. Pregnant women, dragons, heavenly wars between dragons and angels, beasts with multiple heads, that was last week. The lamb with the faithful messengers, angels reaping the earth, and now we come to angels diffing, dishing out plagues with bowls of wrath. It's a movie full of judgment, wrath, and apocalyptic stuff. But it's not a movie, is it? Although I'm sure somebody's made it somewhere, or more than once. This is actually part of the vision the revelation that John had received from Jesus whilst in exile on the land of Patmos. And he was in the spirit. The good news is that this is not the end of the vision. And while it does get fractionally worse if you're reading through Revelation with us, it does very soon get a whole lot better because we're at the beginning of the end. And remember the type of literature that this is. It's apocalyptic. This means it's symbolic, so we don't need to take everything literally. For instance, Jesus is referred to as the lamb, isn't he? Not just here, but elsewhere. But he's not an actual physical lamb. He was a human man. But that's a symbolic part of who he is as the sacrificial lamb, the last and final sacrifice referring back to the sacrifices for sin found in the Old Testament. That means that when we hear of pregnant women, dragons and beasts, as Daniel explained to us last week, we're interested in what they represent. And here in this passage then, what the bowls of wrath represent. So do keep your Bibles open at chapters 15 and 16 as we, as we go through this. But we're first just going to flick back to Revelation chapter 6. Because at that point, we see that the moment we're talking about now has been anticipated for some time. In chapter 6, John gives a picture of those who have died for their faith, crying out to God. And what they cry is, how long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? They want to know, in other words, how long before God puts everything right, including the fact that they were killed for their faith. Yet we don't like language of wrath and vengeance, do we? I mean, wrath links to judgment, and we don't like that either. It's uncomfortable, isn't it? And furthermore, we bring our own experiences of things like anger, either giving or receiving, into our own interpretation as we read this. In fact, wherever we encounter wrath in the whole Bible, and I'm just going to read Romans 1 as just one example of that, where we see the word wrath. Let me just read that for you. Romans 1, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of those who by their wickedness suppress the truth. That's just one example of where we see the word wrath in the Bible. And honestly, we prefer to just kind of gloss over that and ignore it, don't we? Our own Bishop of Chester, Bishop Mark, um, reflecting on the concept of wrath, he says, we have no substantive, active, popular theology which engages with the concept of a God of love who also knows wrath. It seems to me, he says, we usually set love and wrath in opposition to each other and prefer to only think about God's love, despite the fact that this is not a consistent view of love. So in his book, 
called into exile, which I would incidentally recommend, but you might want to read the first uh, book first called Clinging to the Cross. Um, it's a series of three. The third one isn't out yet. But in this book, Mark illustrates this, um, this conflict, if you like, by saying that while when we hear of wrath, we might initially think of fire and brimstone kind of imagery, that actually many a good parent, if they heard of their child being bullied or hurt in some way, would have a primal internal reaction to run out and rain wrath and go and sort out the perpetrator. I don't know about those of you who are parents, but I know I've felt that when my child has been hurt and upset. In fact, I remember Mikey one time thinking I was about to go and lay into one of his teachers because I was so frustrated that he was upset about something. As it was, I wasn't going to go and lay into one of his teachers, you'll be very pleased to know. But I wanted to go and help Mikey resolve the conflict and issue that had arisen. Now, obviously, we wouldn't advocate acting on that primal urge, but let's just note that it is there. And therefore, that wrath can be a normal and natural and even healthy part of a parent's love. God gives people up to the natural consequences of their actions, but he doesn't smite them. He does give them up, though, to those consequences, but not without first providing a way for them to return to him, a way to avoid the wrath. Wrath is linked to justice, you see. Leon Morris said that God's wrath is a strong and settled opposition to all that is evil, and that it rises out of God's nature in the sense of his zeal for right and his hatred for evil. So what's going on with these bowls of wrath? Firstly, I want to note that before the angels pour out their bowls of wrath upon the earth, that worship is sung to God in the words described as the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. Both songs declaring the greatness of God's deeds and of his rescue, that he is just and true and holy, and that all will worship him. In other words, this is coming from a place of holiness, angels dressed in white, a symbol of purity, and the glory of God fills the temple, another sign of holiness. This wrath that is coming is poured out in terms of purity, with complete integrity of God's character, with no spite, no hate, no anger. It all comes from a place of his holiness. And with reference to the song of Moses, we also see, I think, an intentional reminder of the plagues on the Egyptians who were an enemy of God's people. This is back in Exodus, right at the beginning of the Bible. It was a consequence of their not letting God's people go. And we find some echoes of that here. And who are these plagues on? They're not on everyone, but they are on the enemy of God's people, those who have chosen to follow the beast. In fact, they have been marked with the sign of the beast. And we're told at least twice in chapter 16 that these people have had a chance to repent and turn back to God, but that they've refused and refused to change their ways. God is just, and those who have aligned themselves with evil will not escape his wrath. If you've been reading through Revelation as we've gone through this series, you might have noticed that this is the last of seven sets of judgments. There have been seven seals and seven trumpets and now seven bowls of wrath. You won't have come across the seals or the trumpets in one of our sermons, but if you've been reading through, they are there. And that actually they're in fact representing one and the same thing, but from different perspectives. So the seals are from the perspective of the suffering church. The seven trumpets from the perspective of the world 
And this final set of seven bowls of wrath are from the perspective of the throne of God. I don't know that we need to go into great detail in each one of them. But if you've got your Bibles open, you'll be able to see where we are as I reference each one. And we're in chapter 16. Because each of them is poured out on a different aspect of the earth. Initially, we have sores on those who follow the beast, those who have been marked with his sign, as I've referred to earlier. Then we have um, things on physical aspects of the earth that are all part of giving life and sustenance to those who live on earth. So we've got the seas and then the rivers turned to blood. The sun is allowed to scorch people with fire. Darkness descends over all people and people begin cursing God and we're told again that they don't still repent. Despite all that they're suffering, these sores, they're burnt from the sun and they've got no water to drink, they still refuse to repent. And then as we build into a climax of these bowls of wrath, one is thrown into the river Euphrates. Now, I know the river Euphrates is an actual geographical place, And it's been um, really important throughout history um, for the people in that region. However, in the Bible, it's also used symbolically through previous prophetic writings. You'll find it in places like Isaiah. That this river is also a metaphor for judgment and invading armies. And this fits at this point because John sees in his vision all kinds of demonic spirits going to the kings of the world to assemble them for battle against God Almighty. So we've got this symbol that the army of darkness, if you like, is getting ready for battle against God. And then we see the last bowl of wrath thrown into the air as a symbol of total and final judgment. That's all quite a lot to take in, isn't it? God's wrath is hard for us to understand in our culture, but God must ultimately oppose and destroy evil. And this naturally offends those who join the revolt against God. It is, of course, a tragic scene. I think any survivor of war zones, both past and present, would probably most be able to relate to how tragic a scene this is. But it shows God's seriousness regarding right and wrong. And we ignore this to our downfall. Because as much as God's wrath coming from love and justice is a consequence of behavior, his love also extends the answer and the route to stand free from his wrath. And it's important for us to remember that these wraths are poured out on the unrighteous, Because in the previous chapters, the righteous and the unrighteous have already been separated. And let's be clear about this. This is not a separation between the good and the bad, especially by our understanding of good and bad, in terms particularly of behavior. This is God's category. Because if it was good and bad, we would all be in the bad category. Romans 3.23 reminds us that all have sinned and fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God, in his grace, freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. What this is saying is that we should, by rights and behavior, all be on the receiving end of these bowls of wrath and ultimately death. But Jesus, by his grace, removed from that punishment all who have chosen to believe in him. That is the only thing that makes us righteous. The fact that we have believed Jesus, taken him at his word, by turning from rebellion against God's ways and turning towards living for him. Even when we fail, his grace covers our failing when we turn to him. Immediately following the last bowl of wrath is a voice from heaven saying, it is done or it is finished. 
Perhaps you've heard that phrase before. While the judgment and consequence of our sin is justified, Jesus himself took on that judgment and consequence for us on the cross. The same John who experienced this revelation and wrote it down in the book that we read today had previously written the Gospel of John. And he quotes Jesus from the cross as he is dying, crying out, it is finished. On the cross, the price for sin was paid. That's why Jesus cried, it is finished. And after the bowls of wrath are poured out, the same is cried again, it is finished. What is finished? Everything that needs to be done in order for unholy sinners, us, to enter into a relationship with a holy God. The way is made clear and we who respond to Jesus can stand before him in relationship. A way out of the wrath is that we throw ourselves at the foot of the cross. The wrath that should have been ours is experienced by Jesus on the cross, a place where grace and mercy meet. Where God's mercy, because of Jesus, we are not given the punishment that was ours. And grace, the gift of eternal life that should have been denied us, is freely given. Grace and mercy meet together and we are invited in. That is such a beautiful thing. But you might be asking, what of those who don't believe? My old maths teacher, Jeff Lumley, um, from high school, wrote a book on Revelation. I know that's not what you expect a maths teacher to write, and maybe it's the numbers in Revelation, I don't know. But anyway, he describes that we have a choice over whether we are among the righteous or among those who receive the consequence of judgment to come, using the, images, the image sorry, of two trains in a station. So imagine, he says, that you're in a station where there are two trains to take, one headed for Aberdeen and one for Penzance. No reflection on, you know, no, no metaphor as to which is which. It's just that they're, they're in the opposite direction. It's, it's that simple. The train destinations are fixed. You either get on the train to Aberdeen or the one for Penzance. But you choose which one you get on. Even if you have a ticket for one, actually you can still change your mind and buy a ticket for the other one. Even if you get on the train, you can still change your mind and get off as long as the doors have not yet been locked. This final judgment that we read about, if you like, in this image is the locking of the doors. Up until that point, there is still a chance for those not on the train with the righteous to get on. And for those of us who do know Jesus and have been made right with him and go on being made right with him, to share with those that don't know him that there is still a chance for their lives to change. Some people are really desperate to change and just simply need to hear of Jesus. Others actually think they're quite happy as they are but we can still let them know that they have choices and there is a different way. What we do know about God's heart is that he wants everyone to repent and turn back to him. That is why we're still waiting. That's why Jesus hasn't returned yet, why there is a gap at all between Jesus' resurrection and his return. Early Christians struggled to understand this gap but 2 Peter 3 verse 9 assures us the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. I spoke about movies briefly at the start. Do you ever feel like your life is movie-like? I don't mean the mundane everyday stuff but just when you look around you and see what's happening. I know I felt for the first time, I think, very much like that during COVID, 
I sat there thinking, you know, one day movies will be made about what I'm experiencing now and how surreal that felt. But also, when we look across the world and we see wars such as Ukraine and Russia, Israel and Palestine, just simply to name the most prominent two currently, but there are many more. As a world, we've not learnt really, have we, from the experiences of the past, some of which we've remembered this morning. Do you ever feel how long? A bit like the prayer of the martyrs. How long will we continue to muck up this world with all sorts of problems? And I say we intentionally because it's easy, isn't it, to blame others and see what they've not got right. Much harder to see our own contribution, but we are part of this. How long will we see suffering? How long will we see war, abuse, violence, power play, injustice? The list could go on. Over the last few years, I think my feeling an internal cry of how long has grown exponentially. How long before Jesus returns to complete what has already been finished by him on the cross and banish evil for good? How long before his kingdom comes and reigns fully on earth as in heaven? I believe we all have a sense of how long inside of us. You might be aware of it at some times more than others. But the answer to the how long will also involve the outplay of God's wrath on those who reject him. And while we don't know the when, we do know that it will surely come. So what do we do with all of this? How might it affect our daily lives? And I'm going to borrow just briefly from Jane who spoke on this passage last week at St Paul's because she came up with three neat W's and that makes it easier to remember, doesn't it? So worship. Let's continue to worship God. Let's daily recognize our God's character of love, grace, mercy, truth, justice, and how praiseworthy he is. Those around the throne worship him day and night. So might we join with that song? And just a challenge, maybe try singing a song of praise or a hymn every day and see if that makes a difference. Slightly tenuous W, worry not. Um, but it speaks of the reassurance that God is on his throne, that the war against evil has already been won by Jesus, though we don't see the full effects of that until he returns. We're caught, aren't we, in the middle of that battle in terms of what we see around us and experience in our lives. But God is on his throne. And therefore, we don't need to fear the judgment to come because he has paid that price on the cross. He has secured our lives in him if we have turned to him. And if you are any way uncertain about where you stand with this, please come and speak to somebody afterwards. Maybe go and um, ask the prayer team to pray with you or come and talk to me or Hedge or anybody else that you know that might be able to help you. And lastly, witness. My prayer today is that this motivates us into praying regularly for those who don't yet know him and to share him with them when the opportunity arises. You know, we don't need some clever formula for that. I'd probably avoid the language of Revelation too, if I'm honest. But, you know, when we simply share good news stories, often we do that at the start of our services, don't we? It's actually just as simple as sharing some of our good news stories with those who don't yet know Jesus. Show them what he's done in our lives and invite them to seek him for their own good news stories. So let's continue to worship to worry not and to witness as we go forward into this week. Perhaps you'd like to stand and we're just going to leave a moment of quiet for us to respond to God. <clears throat>